How many of you have ever played the game hide and seek? Can I see your hand? Oh man, it's like one of my favorite games. And honestly, I'm not trying to be boastful or brag about it, but I consider myself to be a pretty good player of hide and seek. Uh, I consider myself pretty good at hiding and being short, you know, and Filipino and kind of dark skinned there. I could always hide in different places and it wasn't really hard for me to find a spot that I could just crawl under or tuck myself in and it'd be hard for other people to find me. And so I always did well hiding. I also did good at looking for places to, or looking for people when they hid. And I remember playing with my cousins and my friends and my classmates. Yeah, I was, you know, I would, I would enjoy being the one who finds people and said, found you and found you and so forth. I remember just the summer we had our college and career camp uh, close to Fresno. And we played a variation of hide and seek. We played something uh, called sardines. And sardines is different because in hide and seek, it's usually one person looking for a bunch of people. In sardines, it's somewhat opposite. It's a bunch of people looking for either one or two. And we had partnered two people up and they were hiding and they were supposed to look for people in the dark had their flashlight and they grouped up and I was partnered with my son Kai and I remember uh, you know we gave the group of people that were hiding uh, a couple minutes to hide and it was probably the size of our property from like the gate or the front driveway all the way to the back and our job was to look for those two people hiding and we're like we did a terrible job we couldn't find everybody and now hide and seek is something that I play with my son and my daughter Kai and Layla uh, when we come home or when I come home from work, they'll say, Dad, come play with us. And I say, what do you want to play? And almost instantly they'll say, let's play hide and seek. Now Kai is a good hider. Uh, he loves to hide and he does really well in that. Layla is not so much. Okay? Uh, Layla, she will, she will go behind like a wall or, or behind a curtain and you can see her feet under the curtain if you know what I mean. Uh, sometimes she'll even just be so lazy, she'll sit on the floor and she'll cover her head with a basket or a bin and she thinks that that's good enough for her to hide. Hide and seek, such a memorable game growing up. You know, hide and seek, as fun as a game it is, as fun as, you know, the memories that you may remember, the idea or the concept of hiding doesn't really work when it comes to you and God. First of all, you shouldn't try to hide anything from God, amen? God doesn't want you to hide from Him. God doesn't want you to try or attempt hiding yourself from His presence. In fact, if you read the Bible, there were many people who tried to hide themselves from God. In fact, Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis tried to hide from God when they disobeyed the law of the Lord. They even tried to sow fig leaves upon themselves and uh, made out of aprons, and they tried to cover their sin. And the Bible says that they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Jonah, if you remember him, and by the way, Jonah's not a fairy tale. Jonah is an actual story that happened and occurred in the Bible. The Bible tells us that Jonah uh, tried to hide from God when he called him to be a preacher uh, to Nineveh. And the Bible says he got into this boat and he ran from the presence of the Lord. But God still found him. Achan tried to hide what he stole from, uh, from, uh, from Jericho. Gehazi tried to hide uh, his unjust gain from Elisha. Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts tried to hide their false advertised financial gain from God, and God found them out. You see, there's no use and there's no sense in trying to hide from God because God is omnipresent. He sees everything, and He sees everywhere, or He's everywhere. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. In 2 Chronicles 69, the Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And so God, uh, God's presence permeates the entire place of earth, and there is no sense, no use, no success in trying to hide from God. But secondly... It's important to understand and remember that God is not hiding from you. God is not trying to play hide and seek with you. God is not trying to uh, give you difficult moments of where you're trying to search for Him and you can't find Him. He's not trying to avoid you and He's not trying to avoid being found. In fact, in the opposite of that, God wants you to find Him. In Jeremiah 23, 23, He says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? You see, God is not far and God is not distant. God wants us to find Him. God wants us to experience a closeness with Him. God wants us to walk with Him and to know His presence, not just on Sundays, but every day throughout the week. Yeah. Not just when you're in church, but at home or at school or at work, wherever you are, God wants you to know the reality of His presence. Now, with that in mind, we're going to study this chapter in the book of Isaiah. 
And then in this introduction, I just want to make a, a few comments regarding Isaiah and his book. Isaiah is a wonderful book. It's a, it's a book that is filled with great doctrines about God. It's a book filled with historical records regarding Judah's kingdom. It's a book filled with great prophecies and future prophecies regarding Israel and God's people. Isaiah ministered as a prophet uh, to Judah during the reign of four kings. You want to mark this down. He was a prophet to uh, the time when Uzziah reigned, Jotham, Ahaz, and even Hezekiah. And so he had a, an extensive ministry, uh, a lot of period, a lot of kings where he was able to prophesy. And in this book, in here in the book of Isaiah, we read about really three key prophecies. The first prophecy that Isaiah mentions in his book is the prophecy regarding the captivity of Israel through the invasion of Assyria and Babylon. When you read the book of Isaiah, he'll prophesy about a coming nation. First is Assyria, and they were going to invade and overtake the people of God. And after Assyria, there would come a second nation. The Babylonian nation would come to invade, again, Israel and take them captive. And he prophesied about that captivity and invasion. He also prophesied about the Messiah. In fact, if you study the book of Isaiah, and a lot of scholars and commentators would even call Isaiah as the evangelist of the Old Testament. Because all of his writing, most of his writing spoke about the Messiah, the coming Christ. He talked about the Christ and his coming. Remember in Isaiah 7 verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And if you uh, cross-reference Isaiah chapter 7 to Matthew chapter number 1, you'll find that he's speaking about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 7, 14, he says that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and, he shall call, or, and we shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Notice this, and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. By the way, that verse in the Old Testament, not the New, that verse in the Old Testament proves that Jesus Christ is God. And so Isaiah writes about the coming of Christ. He writes about the crucifixion of Christ. If you've ever read Isaiah 53, it's a very clear depiction of what Christ will experience in his crucifixion. Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 reads, Surely he that is Jesus Christ prophesied, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he, Jesus Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the Bible says. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And by the way, let me just say this. There is no other religion that teaches that God came down to die and suffer for the sins of man. Only Christianity teaches that. Every other religion will teach you that you can earn your way to heaven by doing good works or by being religious or by, 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 by following a creed and following some tradition. That doesn't get you to heaven. Only the work of Christ can get you to heaven. The Jesus who is perfectly God came into this world, put on human flesh, and according to Isaiah 53, he suffered for us. He took our stripes. He took our beatings. He was sh uh, his blood was shed. He was wounded for us in order to pay for our sins. And Isaiah prophesied about the crucifixion of Christ. He also prophesied about the conquering of Christ, that Christ would come to this world and rule and reign. In Isaiah 61, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And simply saying what Isaiah said there was a prophecy of a time where God's Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come to preach good tidings to his people. Now, when we think about the prophecies of Isaiah, there was a prophecy of invasion, the prophecy of the Messiah, and then according to chapter number 60 to 65, what well, we actually read are prophecies about the new Jerusalem within which God will establish here on earth a kingdom for Israel for them to experience full salvation. And in this chapter, chapter 64, what we read is in Isaiah's vision, he had an emphasis of prayer. He said, knowing that Christ is going to come back, knowing that this invasion will be fulfilled, knowing that there would be a Messiah that would come to deliver, he had one emphasis in this prayer in chapter number 64, and the emphasis of his prayer is the presence of God. 
Three times we read it in verse 1. Oh, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Verse 2, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Verse 3, that the mountains flow down at thy presence. You see this, uh, this chapter, Isaiah, as he writes it, is asking for the presence of God to come down and be with his people. Because in reality, what he understood, more than just victory against his enemy, and more than just deliverance from captivity, and more than just a prosperous kingdom to rebuild, what he understood as a prophet is what his people needed most is not the deliverance, it's not the defeat of their enemies, and it's not to rebuild a prosperous kingdom. What they needed was the presence of God. And I want to use that as a drawing point as we go into our message this morning. What do you think you need more of? What is it right now that if you could just have a little bit more, you think you'll be happier? A raise? A vacation time? A promotion? If you could just have more time with so-and-so and this person that you're close to? If you could just have more health and if you could just have uh, uh, more job opportunities? What is it in your life that you think you need more of right now that will cause you to be happier? Because the reality is if it's not God's presence... Whatever you're trying to fill your life with is not going to be enough. Do you want more of God's presence this morning? Are you seeking and pursuing more of God's presence in your life? Are you asking and praying? And there, are you, do you have the heart of Isaiah here in chapter number 64 where you cry out and say, Lord, oh God, I need more of your presence. God, I need more of you. Lord, I need your presence to be real in my life right now. And so we're going to study three lessons about the presence of God. Number one, I want to point out, as you're taking notes or just following along listening, I want to point out, first and foremost, the reality of God's presence. Notice how in Isaiah 64, notice that in his cry and his prayer, he assumes the reality of God's presence. Listen, guys, God is real. God's not a fairy tale or some fable. God is not just some big man up in the sky somewhere. No, God is real. And the Bible teaches us that God is a person that wants to have a relationship with you and I. And by the way, there's only one type of reality that we need to live by. And that is God's reality. And you better be careful that you don't walk in this world believing lies and believing other uh, types of teachings and doctrines. And you're not trying to, uh, trying to fit in in what somebody else tells you. You need to go to the truth of God's word to figure out what reality is. A lot of people are living in an illusion of lies. They don't think that there's anything after, after this life. That's not what the Bible teaches. They don't think that life is valuable. That's not what the Bible teaches. They don't think that after this life, there's no consequences for this sin. That's not what the Bible teaches. We got to live according to the truth of God's word. This is reality. God is a real person and he wants to show his presence to you because his presence is real. It's something that he wants you to know and to understand. His presence is something that he wants you to experience and to enjoy, not just in good times, but even in the darkest moments of your life. To understand who he is in the valley, to understand who he is in a time of despair and loneliness and distress. God wants, your, God wants you to know and experience and enjoy his presence in every area of your life. Let's talk about the reality of his presence. First, notice this, his presence is awesome. The word awesome means to inspire awe, to be filled with awe. Amen. How many of you guys have ever seen something awesome? Maybe if you like cars, uh, you saw maybe a, an old car that was refurbished and restored. Maybe like a, I, I don't know, I'm not too, too much into cars, a 67 Mustang restored. I don't know. All you guys see now are like Teslas and electronic cars, right? <laughs> Maybe you've seen a beautiful sight, a Hawaiian sunset, a Caribbean sunset, and you looked at that and you're like, wow, breathtaking. If you're into sports, I, I'm, in, and I'm into sports, I can't wait for basketball season and football season to start. You see one of those one hand grab and the guy's like flying back, it's being thrown and he stretches out his arm, he catches the ball, his elbow touches the ground, and you're like, what? How did he catch that? Or like when Steph Curry, right, and he goes down, the, bu the, 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 the buzzer's about to go off, a few seconds left, he shoots it from half court, and it goes in, and you're like, wow, that's awesome. Some of you guys are just not easily impressed, right? You like, <laughs> look for something really hard, really something rare to be impressed. I, I get impressed pretty easily there, too. 
Out of all the things that you've seen, I've seen the Hawaiian sunsets, I've seen the Niagara Falls, I've been to Uganda and I visited a safari at Queen Elizabeth National Park. I saw elephants showering themselves in the lake there. I saw hippos that tried to chase after a boat. Uh, I've seen lions and its pride and all the, all the group of lions there. I mean, just looking at it, I was like, wow. And I wonder, do we ever get like that when we see the presence of God? Are we ever amazed at who God is? Do we ever just stop and, 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 and just stare and look at how magnificent God's glory is? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me why people can come to church and think it's boring. Pastor AJ, it doesn't make sense to me that people could come to church to a church like ours. And I know there's some funky churches out there, but praise the Lord, there's Heritage Baptist Church, right? I, I just don't get it. How people can come to church Sunday after Sunday, sit at service after service, listen to their preaching, listen to the music, listen to the prayer, listen to the testimonies of a God has been changing people's lives, listen to the visitors that are coming on a week-to-week basis, listening to people calling upon Christ their Savior, and think that church is boring. It doesn't make sense to me that they could sit through a movie for about an hour, hour and a half to two hours, or they could go to a sporting event, and they could be all energetic, and they could jump up and down, and they're cheer for their team, or even weep and cry on a movie or some show that they're watching. But when it comes to preaching, or it comes to meeting God at church, they're sleeping. They're disinterested. Because you know what they're coming? They're coming here for to be entertained. And if you're here day after day, Sunday after Sunday, service after service, and you're not meeting with the presence of God, you're missing out. And you have forgotten how awesome the presence of God is. Listen, to every person that met the presence of God, Isaiah, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, where the Bible says, in the year King Uzziah died, the Bible says that Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. He says his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly, the Bible says. And Isaiah writes, and one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw the presence of God and it changed his life. Daniel the prophet saw God's presence. Ezekiel the prophet saw God's presence. Peter, James, and John saw the glory of God's presence when Jesus transfigured before their eyes on the mountain. The apostle John, uh, isolated in the island of Patmos, saw the vision of God's presence. And all, you know what happened to all of them? They fell down. And in awe, they marveled. The awesome presence of God. Yes. Some of you have not seen it yet. Some of you have seen and have forgotten. Some of you treat this book like it's any other textbook. Some comic book. Some of you come to church and it's just, yeah, I'm here because my mom told me to go. My sister told me to go. My wife makes me go. My parents told me to go. That's not why we go. We go to church so we see the awesome presence of God. Amen. You know what David said? He said in chapter or Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing he said. He said, One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Amen. See, David knew why he was at church. It's to see the awesome presence of God. Listen, God's presence is awesome. God's presence also, secondly, is assuring. The word assuring means to dispel doubt or confusion. It means to instill confidence and remove worry. Anyone who has experienced the presence of God understands how much comfort and assurance His presence can give. Like I mentioned earlier, I love playing with my kids. And one of the things that I like to do sometimes is to put either Kai and Layla on top of like a, uh, like a table or uh, a tall ledge. And I'll, I'll step back a little bit. And after they're standing up, I'll say, all right, come jump. Come jump. And sometimes I'll go really, really far, right, and really scare them. And uh, trying to just let them know, hey, I'll catch you. I promise I'm here. I won't let anything happen to you. Even in the pool, they'll go to the edge of the pool and they'll jump towards me. And when they feel like it's too far, you know what they say? Dad, Dad, come close. Come close. Come closer, Dad. Come closer. 
You know why? Listen to this. Because closeness is confidence. Closeness is confidence. And when you experience the presence of God, it will assure you in three areas of your life. First, the assurance of God's presence is evident in our serving. I want you to take your Bibles for a second. I apologize that we don't have notes for you guys to look through or the slides. But go to Exodus chapter 33 for a second. I'll give you context while you're we're returning there. In the book of Exodus, we find in the very first chapter that God's people, Israel, were in bondage under the nation of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And so God, after hearing their burdens and after hearing their cries, God raises up a deliverer by the man of the name Moses. And Moses is a picture of Christ. And Moses, the Bible tells us, would be God's servant who would go to Pharaoh and God would empower him and through him would allow, would allow God's people to uh, be freed from the bondage of, uh, of Egypt. And so now in chapter number 33 of Exodus, what we find is actually they're out of Egypt and now they're about to enter into the biggest journey of their life, into the promised land. And they wander through the wilderness and all of that. But before all of that began, I want you to see a glimpse of how God's presence was assuring to Moses. In Exodus chapter 33, are you there? Are you guys there? All right, verse number 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. By the way, God knows your name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, this is God speaking to Moses after he had made a request. God said to Moses, my presence shall go with thee. Would you say that with me? Ready? My presence shall go with thee. How comforting. He says, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And this is Moses' response to God. He says, and he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us up, not hence. He says, Lord, if your presence go not with me, I don't want to go. Lord, you want to leave me here. But if you don't walk beside me, if you're not going to walk with me to get over here, then God, I don't want to go here. He said, God, I don't want to serve you without the presence of God in my life. I don't want to serve these people. I don't want to go through this trial. I want to go through this uh, type of ministry in in, in order to serve you if your presence is not with me. No, a lot of times there's so many things that we we try to do for God. And we hit a wall. We say, God, I just don't have the strength to do it. I can't preach. I can't teach. I can't win souls. I can't keep knocking doors. God, I don't know how to do this. And he says, Erwin, it's okay. I'm here, and my presence is with you. I'm right beside you, and I can give you strength. I'm right beside you, and I can show you guidance. I'm right beside you, Erwin. Anything you need, I'm right here. And my presence can give you assurance in times of service. Notice this. God's presence gives us assurance in our suffering. You ever read the book of Job? Ever read up in the book of Psalms and 1 Samuel how David was running from Saul? In their times of sorrow and suffering, in their times of solitude, you know what they asked for? Not just deliverance, but the presence of God. In a congregation like this, there has to be somebody that's struggling right now. Somebody in their suffering, somebody in a time of trial and hardship, and you're wondering, is there anybody who understands what I'm going through? Is there anybody who cares for me? Is there anybody who understands what to do and how to help and what, to, what, what, what counsel to give? And, and, and all the people around you may be so oblivious to what you're going through, but you know what God says? I'm here. I know. And I understand. We see his presence is assuring. His presence is awesome. But also notice this, his presence is altering. Did you catch it in chapter number 64 of Isaiah? That the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Now, mountains just don't flow down. That nations may tremble. You see, what he's saying here is anybody who comes close to the presence of God will always experience change and transformation. Abraham was in the presence of God, and God changed his name. 
Jacob wrestled in the presence of God, and God touched his thigh. Moses saw the presence of God in the burning bush, and God changed his future. Isaiah was in the presence of God, and God touched his lips. Paul was in the presence of God, and he changed his life from being a persecutor of Christians to being a preacher of Christ. You see, if you're here today, and you have a hard heart towards others and towards God, if you just get a glimpse and experience his presence, he can change you. If you're struggling with bitterness and hatred towards somebody else, God's presence can change you. If you're somebody who's always worrying, always anxious about life and always panicking, God can change you if you just put yourself in his presence. If you're somebody who's always filled with lust, filled with covetousness, greed, God says he can change you from being somebody who's greedy and covetous to somebody who's being content if you just but get into the presence of the Lord. Listen, if you're in darkness today, and that means that you are not sure you're saved, if you don't know if you're going to heaven after this life, if you feel like you have no relationship with God, he can change that. If you just come to his presence this morning, God is inviting any person in this room who's not 100% sure they're going to heaven, who's not 100% sure that heaven's their home. He's inviting you to his presence to know him, that he's a loving God, a merciful God, a gracious God, somebody who can forgive your sins and give you uh, light in your darkness, give you life in your death. He's somebody that could change your life forever. If you just come into his presence this morning, have you been in his presence? Do you stand at awe at the glory of God's presence? We see the reality of his presence. Number two, we see the revelation of God's presence. Notice in verse number four of Isaiah 64. In Isaiah 64, the Bible says, For since the beginning of the world... Men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. In fact, if you study the New Testament, Paul quotes this verse in 1 Corinthians 2.9. He says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. This past uh, Father's Day, Kai was super excited uh, to give me a gift that he had made in class uh, for Father's Day as a gift. He was kind of bummed out because the gift that he made for Mother's Day a month before uh, actually fell and dropped and it broke and he couldn't give it to, to, to mom. And so uh, this time he wanted to make sure that he made two gifts so just in case one breaks, he'll have another <laughs> gift to give. But I remember he came up to me, his hands were behind his back holding the gift and he said, Dad, close your eyes. I have something for you. He's trying to prepare, you know, trying to let me see, like he gets super excited, he's trying to hype me up, right? He said, guys, close your eyes and open your hands. And he put in my hand with my eyes closed, and I could feel it. It was a baseball, and with his handprint on it. And then one was like this little drawing art craft thing with like his hand and like a grill, and like says like you're a great dad or whatever. And then he was just so joyful that when I opened my eyes, he saw me smile and I was thankful. Because in his eyes, he said, I did this, I prepared this for my dad, and now he gets to enjoy it. You know what this verse is saying, verse 4 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9? That God is preparing something for those that wait for him. That God wants you to enjoy something, his presence. And he reveals it to us in two ways. You want to make note of this, please follow along. The first way that God revealed himself is through his person, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the clearest revelation of who God is. John 1 verses 1 to 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. And if you cross-reference verses 1 to 3 to verse 14 of John 1, the Bible says the Word was made flesh, and He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. As the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. In Colossians 1, 15, we're told that Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Colossians 1, 15, who is the image of the invisible God. In Colossians 2, 9, for in him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see, when God wanted to reveal himself to you, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we would see his presence. You understand when Jesus came to this world as a baby, it wasn't just any baby. It was God in the flesh. Do you understand when Jesus 
came to this world to walk with men, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, and to heal those that uh, had diseases. It was God walking with men. Do you understand that anyone who accepts Jesus Christ into their heart is not just accepting religion? In fact, we don't even want religion, amen? Religion is man's way to get to heaven. You know what you need? A relationship through Jesus Christ. And when you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you are receiving God himself because Jesus is God and God is Jesus. So when he wanted to reveal himself, he revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ. But secondly, he revealed himself through his precepts. That is the, the complete, inspired, written word of God. You see, when you open this book, the Bible, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrows and the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When you study this book from cover to cover, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelations 21, what you'll find and understand is God is revealing himself to you through each page of this book. He wants you to understand who he is. And you, when you open it, you begin to realize just how marvelous and glorious he is. Amen. Let me say this. If you are a Christian that's not reading the Bible... If you're a Christian who's neglected the word of God in your life, then your faith is lifeless. Faith is dead. Your vision is dead. No power, no joy, no gratitude. A Christian who doesn't read their Bible is a lifeless Christian. Their prayer life is lifeless. Their ministry is lifeless. Their soul winning is lifeless. And I mean, how can you say that you've been in the presence of God if you haven't opened the word to spend time with it? You know what the psalmist said in Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 19? He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Amen. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. You see, God didn't play hide and seek with you. Right. He wants you to know him. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, and he gave you his living word, the word of God. That leads us to our last point, and thank you so much for paying attention and listening. We've seen the reality of God's presence. We've seen the revelation of God's presence, but lastly, notice with me the requirement for his presence. Go back to Isaiah 64 if you have a moment, and look at verse number 5 and following with me if you could, please. In verse number 5, Notice those first three words. Thou meetest him. I don't know about you, but that excites me. God wants to meet you. God wants you to meet him. And he tells us right here how we can meet him. He says, thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned in those in his, his continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like a wind have taken us away. He says in verse 7, And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth himself up to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, Amen. and we all are the work of thy hand. Have you ever remembered meeting somebody special? Or the first time I met my wife was in Bible college, Genesis class. She walked in and I was like, man, she is cute. <laughs> I got to know her. Or the first time I met her parents, actually. It, I, I wasn't even dating Kat. It was in the Thanksgiving banquet here. We used to be in that old building in the front. Remember that? No AC, right? They used to split up the Thanksgiving banquets into different rooms. I was out there helping serve. And in room A, I remember meeting uh, Kat's mom and dad. Just very casually, just saying hi and so forth. And then when we actually dated and uh, had asked for permission to date her, we, we, we met uh, at a restaurant back down there in Lancaster. And that was different. That wasn't casual at all, right? <laughs> I wanted to put on my best and I wanted to make sure that when I meet them that they're impressed. I remember meeting Kai and Layla for the first time. When Kai was born, holding him in my arms. My son. Layla, my daughter. Man, when you meet somebody special, it, it changes you, right? 
God says he wants you to meet him. And there's two ways. First, he mentions that there's an essential exercise. Notice it here. Thou meetest him that rejoices and worketh righteousness. Now you say, what work of righteousness can we ever do that would allow us to meet God? And the Bible answers that for us with one word. And the word is this. Please pay attention. The way you can have a work of righteousness that could, that could meet the requirement of meeting God is this. One word. Faith. It's the only thing God requires of you. He doesn't care about your talents, what you can do or what you can't do. He doesn't care about your profile, your investments. He doesn't care about your stocks. He doesn't care about your background, your upbringing. He doesn't care about your intellect or what type of education you have. All he cares about is this. Do you have faith? In Romans 1.17, the Bible says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 4.5, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You know what that verse teaches? The only thing God requires of you to meet him is to have faith in him. To believe that he is who he says he is. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you have faith in God this morning? We see an evident, or sorry, an essential exercise. But letter B, lastly, we see the evident expression. You say, how do I know if I have faith? And how is my faith expressed in given evidence? Well, there's two places for that. First, you exercise faith at salvation. Did you catch it there in verse number six? He says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. You see, what that teaches us that is this, is that you and I can never be good enough to get to heaven. Right. As I close, I want to make again a plea. I, I, I want to make a clear invitation that if you're sitting in this room today, that if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, that means you are yet in your sin. That means in your sin, you can't go to heaven. That means in your sin, you still have to bear the consequences of that. But God invites you to accept his son, Jesus Christ, so that your sins would be forgiven, so that your sins would be removed, and that you would be free from its consequences. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, for the heart, or for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13 such a wonderful verse regarding salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You want to know how to exercise faith? It has to start with salvation. It has to start at the moment where you say, Lord, I can't save myself. I can't get rid of my sins on my own. No good work, no church membership, no baptism can ever save me, but only through Jesus Christ alone that he died for my sins and rose again. Amen. But it doesn't stop there. You see, God wants you to continue meeting him. Right. And so faith may start at salvation, but faith is exercised in our surrender. Continually, we must surrender to God right. by faith if we want to meet him. You see, in chapter 64, when he says in verse 8, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. You know what he's saying there? God wants to meet with us after salvation through surrender. That every moment of our life, every area of our life, every aspect of our life is fully yielded to the hand of the Lord. Amen. As a Christian, if you want to meet God, you got to give God everything. Right. you got to lay it all on the altar. No holds bar. I don't know if you've figured it out yet, but as a Christian, you need to learn this. The Christian faith is an all or nothing faith. That's right. Right. To experience God completely for who he is, to understand his presence, you got to be all in. And if not, you're missing out. So this morning as we close, I hope that you have a desire, a greater desire now more than ever before to pursue the presence of God. It's what we need, amen? If you're not saved this morning, I pray that God's presence and his love will be something that you meet today.